Fintech Festival 2024. And with me today, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Mike Breen, who is with uh, Audex, a solutions provider, incubator, understand charts uh, venture, who is going to be sharing with us a topic about banking as a service. So thank you so much, uh, Mike, for your time today. Thanks for having me. Good to meet you. Yes, uh, so uh, Mike, you know, uh, I think a lot of our audience would have been familiar with, you know, the concepts of pl platform as a service, software as a service, cloud solutions provider as a service. So what is banking as a service? So banking as a service is a relatively new term. It's probably only existed for about five years. And it is fundamentally allowing banks to extend their financial products and services into non-regulated platforms. So a bank can take it a loan or a current account or a, a line of credit and deliver that inside a third party who can distribute the financial products on their behalf. Okay, so I guess um Maybe for our audience, uh, a concept that's analogous to that is, you know, uh, walking to a car showroom, buying a car, and then the uh, dealer offering uh, products such as, you know, leasing or loans products. Is that, but it's online. Similar concept. I think the best way of th seeing that most people have seen banking as a service or as a concept today would be when you buy an airline ticket and they ask you if you want insurance at the same time. That is a banking as an embedded finance product in a non-financial uh, service. All oh, right. Okay. So, what is the sort of the target kind of partners that you work with to deliver some of these products? Is it um, transport sectors, uh, food and services? So, Audix is actually a technology provider. Uh, we are not a bank. Uh, we provide our technology to banks for the banks to actually distribute their products to third parties. Those third parties could be um, e-commerce players, marketplaces, they could be ride hailing, it could be uh, supermarkets, airlines, um, educational services. In the future, this would quite easily extend into car leasing, so distributing the finances from a car, a car dealer directly. Or, or even a mortgage, where mm. the actual constructor, the building uh, constructor, could actually resell the mortgages as well. So are we talking about uh, microfinance or micro loans? You know, there's this concept called um, where you deliver sort of financial products to the unbanked or the underserved uh, segment. So, so this is actually a key use case for banking as a service of how do you reach underbanked, underserved uh, populations. So Indonesia is a very good example where you've got a large geography, um, you know, tens of thousands of islands, you've got a large population, hundreds of millions, where a significant portion of that population either cannot reach financial services, is unbanked or underserved, and has no access in the financial system. So by providing alternative financial services to them, you can actually give uh, an underbanked and underserved uh, person access to a product like a microfinance product via a distribution partner that can help them to understand what the product is, provide financial literacy, um, and really extend the, uh, the financial system to this type of community. So you talked about Indonesia. Is there other sort of regions around the world where this uh, kind of products will be particularly suitable? So banking is a service. Um, so banking is a service is the technology Embedded finance is what you would, is how you actually envisage, uh, envisage it as a consumer. So the actual technology is being delivered all over the world today. Uh, it's been delivered in a number of different forms. The way it, and the US and the Europe have had a number of uh, examples of banking as a service being delivered in a model that we don't believe is sustainable. That model is where the bank provides their balance sheets, their regulatory framework, they make that available to a technology provider who then sells those services on the bank's behalf. The challenge with this model is that the bank has little control of the regulation, but is still responsible to the regulator for the actual financial products that are being distributed. That model has been running for quite a number of years. It probably only existed, or it really only existed, because the technology wasn't available for banks to distribute the services themselves. So this, these ecosystems came up, and there have been a number of them that, uh, that launched, and the US did a lot of this, that are now actually have had a lot of problems. Um, and the US regulators or regulators around the world are putting a lot more scrutiny on that model. We contend with our solution and what we're delivering, the banks no longer need that middle manager, middleman. They can actually execute this themselves because the technology exists and the regulatory framework exists to support it. Right, so in this sort of setup, are we... When we think about sort of um, the traditional sort of uh, banking risk, like credit risk, right? 
or uh, anti-money laundering risk. Who will be owning the risk? Is that the you know the bank, the technology provider, the you know the so partner that, that you partner with? The, the way that we contend that banking as a service should work is the bank is the distributor of their products. They own the risk. They own the responsibility to the regulator. They own the responsibility for the security. All the things that the bank needs to do today as a bank, they have to extend to the third parties that are executing their services. Right, okay. So if we take, for example, anti-money laundering risk, right? Uh, you know, we have a customer, say an end user, who is based in Australia, uh, <coughs> not Australia, Indonesia, right? Um, uh, on e-commerce site, right? Looking to, you know, for insurance product or a loan, right? And the banking as a service, technology provider as, like yourself, provide that technology infrastructure layer and whichever bank that you partner with will provide that kind of banking product. So at the point of onboarding that user for this particular financial product, would the end user be submitting, you know, um, what kind of information would they have to submit to, you know, the platform provider or the bank in order to onboard the customer for that particular so financial product? They are, they are becoming a customer of the bank. So all the details that you would need to perform today for any type of banking service, if you go to DBS today, you have to provide identity, they go through AML, KYC, risk assessment. All of those activities need to be done uh, because the customer ultimately becomes a reported, regulatory reported customer of the bank and not actually a customer of the e-commerce provider for the financial service. All right, so all the customer data <coughs> actually sits in the bank. So the, uh, the e-commerce provider will not be holding any of that information in the infrastructure anywhere? So that, that's correct. So this type of information um, is, is regulated uh, and the bank is the responsible custodian of that information and that data. Okay. Now I want to talk about cybersecurity risk. Like you say, you know, a lot of the information actually sits with the bank. So presumably the cybersecurity sort of uh, measures, um, uh, mitigation uh, approach uh, that the bank has for its existing infrastructure that will apply in this case. So uh, from the e-commerce provider point of view, um, how would that, that relationship or the uh, additional sort of banking as a service relationship alter the approach to cybersecurity potentially? Yes, yeah, so, so there's two pieces of this. There is the regulatory requirement around cybersecurity that uh, the banks need to adhere to. And then, there's what the, and then there is the industry requirements around data sharing and the industry requirements of data ownership. Uh, so all of those remain as they are. What you then have is this new connectivity between the two parties, the bank and the and the uh, partner, and the bank will have to cr w uh, understand and work out how it, ext it extends its security capabilities into that third party. And that will be on a case-by-case -case basis because each bank will have their own methods and approaches and policies as to how to apply it. Okay. Right, so we talked about anti-money laundering risk, we talked about cybersecurity risk, and we talked about how the uh, banks ultimately, I guess, will have a lot of responsibilities, roles and responsibilities when it comes to safeguarding all this uh, in information. Uh, taking a step away from the risk uh, side of things, uh, talking about, thinking about the main theme of this uh, FinTech conference, which is tokenization, digitalization, AI, which is a big topic, and how that will uh, change the way that you think about banking as a service um, I think a lot of people talk about AI-powered chatbots, and I don't know whether that's something that you offer as a technology solution provider as well. Yeah. So, so the interesting piece um, around, around this for a lot of banks is that whilst they want to implement AI tools, they potentially don't have their data ready to, uh, to, be, uh, to create a large language model to support the AI tools they want to develop. So they f I, we, we see that uh, the bank themselves need to get their house in order from a data ownership and data management point of view before they actually embark on an AI journey. Um, we're helping the banks as we're developing these platforms with our, uh, with our data sets um, to enable new use cases, use cases such as uh, an AI chatbot today, but future cases around how you manage, uh, how you use AI to develop risk models, uh, to do fraud decisioning and detection. So the bank needs to get some of their house in order first before they actually really embark on these AI journeys. There's also a number of considerations and, and the chatbot is a very interesting one for a bank. If a bank, as a, a, your relationship manager, provides you financial advice, they are responsible to provide you the right financial advice for you as an individual. If a chatbot provides you financial advice, 
the bank is still responsible for that advice that was generated because it's a representative, AI or not, the bank provided a service to the client and potentially provided financial advice. So the framework that the bank needs to create there around the, uh, what their chatbot can do and cannot do is, has to be very, very sure. Customer service, absolutely, it's something you can help with. Providing um, financial advice is something that, I'm not saying you don't do it, but it's, a, it's something that a bank needs to consider very closely. Yeah, I think there have been quite a few cases where the chatbots uh, provide advice as to, you know, uh, you are eligible for a refund or discount. And uh, I think there was a very famous case, uh, Air Canada, right, uh, where the chatbot says to the customer that, okay, you can get a refund for your ticket. But then, um, then when the particular customer actually call out Air Canada and get a human sort of operator, the answer was different, that you can't. So it actually went to the courts, but it was still undecided, I, I guess. I think at the end of the day, I guess it depends on the jurisdiction that you are in and whether they recognize the AI chatbot as an agent or, you know, um, uh, expression of a human sort of operator and I guess uh, it's still undecided across the world so it depends on which country you operate uh, that particular technology in. And, 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 I, and I, I personally think AI in banking is quite nascent. Um, there, are, there are use cases, there's lots of underlying use cases around risk management, fraud detection and the like that are you know, super smart but I, I think you know, we're, we're just at the very start of, uh, of, of what AI can bring to, to financial services. Um, as I said earlier, the vast majority of banks are not actually in a position to have a data set that's usable um, across their entire customer base or across all of the actual uh, applications and services. Many, many banks will have hundreds and hundreds of domains that they're delivering. That data will not be federated from those hundreds of domains. These are the sorts of challenges that banks need to work on, I think, first, before they start trying to uh, Con conquer the AI uh, experience. All oh, right. So what you're saying is that sort out, you know, uh, in-house. Get your house in order. Right. First, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. And um, the other sort of emerging technology is uh, blockchain, right? Uh, yeah. So how does that change the nature of the kind of services you, that you provide? So, so from our point of view, again, we are a, a rail for the bank. So if the bank wants to distribute services over a traditional rail, uh, as they do today whether they want to make a product or a service available over a, over a blockchain. For us, that's not really our domain because um, we're not actually doing the flows of the money. We're managing it within the bank's domain, the bank's system. So where I could see a use case for, uh, for, for blockchain in this domain is how, back to the data conversation we had earlier, is as this new data is generated between bank and partner, that that actually that that data for that user could be put onto a, onto a distributed ledger that they have co-ownership of. Um, that's a use case that I think has some uh, ha could have some traction in the future, but I've not actually seen it uh, yet. Right. Okay. So uh, for uh, you know an, any of the uh, sort of e-commerce sites or a uh, right healing company listening to this podcast and thought, okay, you know, I'm going to call out Mike, right, and talk about a potential sort of. Uh, 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 partnership, what is the first thing that they need to do? So the first thing I'll tell them is you need to call the bank. <laughs> okay, uh, so you our, need to decide which bank. So Audix's customer is a bank. Mm. Uh, now, the ecosystem is a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. The banks need partners, the partners need banks. So people need to get started. So our conversation primarily is banks, but when the banks need help, we also have partners that are eco eager to do this, uh, to implement these types of services. Ah, okay. So we will, we will connect them to each right. other and facilitate the discussion, but our customer will be the bank, not the partner. Oh, I see. And your platform is, uh, your solution is uh, flexible. Uh, it's uh, what, what I call it, uh, bank agnostic. We are agnostic in many ways. We are bank agnostic. We are platform agnostic. Right. So whilst we can deploy in any cloud service, we can also deploy in the bank's data centers because a lot of banks still, particularly in this part of the world, have not moved into a cloud, have not put their data into the cloud yet. They keep everything on premise. So we've built our solution to accommodate the different ways that banks will want to implement on a private cloud with AWS, on a, on a, on a cloud with GCP, or keep it inside their own domain. So that's the first piece. The next piece, we're not just bank agnostic, we're bank core agnostic. 
because we're not proposing to the banks that you replace your existing core banking. We will work with their legacy core banking platforms, uh, and some of those platforms could be 20, 30, 40 years old, and we will work with those platforms and help them modernize their legacy core banking and their legacy environments without having to replace it all in one go. And this, from a bank's point of view, is a, risk, a very important risk mitigation strategy that you don't want to, on Monday, be running on this platform or on Tuesday running on this platform. It's too much risk. Um, some would say for, for a bank CTO, CIO, it's career limiting uh, to take on such a challenge. So we are, uh, we're a proponent of uh, building an adjacent technology platform, not just for banking as a service, because we deliver for banking modernization as a whole, rebuilding digital channels, uh, modernizing data infrastructure, modernizing customer experience, and delivering new channels. So whether it's banking as a service, whether it's the mobile app, whether it's open banking, um, all of these services come out of our platform. Oh, right, okay. I, th I think it deserves, uh, this uh, podcast deserves a much longer conversation <laughs> because uh, I think we only skimmed the surface in terms of what you can offer and kind of the partners that you work with and the type of risk that we need to think about. I think this is a very uh, sort of first layer look at uh, banking as a service. So thank you so much uh, for your time today, Mike. Thanks so much for having me.